Hello and welcome to Lamplighter. Today is April 5. Today, as we continue to read about King Saul, we find King Saul becoming more and more afraid, more and more paranoid as he reaches the end of his tenure as king. It appears in today's reading that the Philistines are nearing in to attack Israel, and as the Philistine army approaches Israel, we are told that Saul himself is afraid. And so F Saul wants to inquire of the Lord. That's what typically the Israelites do when they want to have victory in battle. So Saul tries to inquire of the Lord to no avail. He tries several different techniques that have been used in the past, but it appears that God is not hearing him. God is not listening to him at all. Saul continues to panic and he needs some kind of special help. And so he asks his men to find a medium in the land. Find a woman, he says, who is a medium. Now, the trick here is that Saul has already, we're told, cast out all the mediums and spiritists in the land. He has made it illegal for them to practice this kind of sorcery, and yet Saul is so desperate to have help in this battle that he tells his men to find a woman who is a medium. Well, they find one, and they try to get her to help Saul. She doesn't recognize him at first, but she does say, I can't do this because I could get in some serious trouble here. And Saul reassures her that everything will be okay. So she wants to conjure up a spirit to help Saul out, and Saul says, I want you to conjure up who I asked for. And she says, okay, who? And he says, Samuel. Well, somehow she's able to conjure up the spirit of Samuel, and there's probably no one here more surprised than the woman herself. And Saul sees the spirit of Samuel and begins to have a conversation with him. And he says, I've tried to inquire of God, and God is not hearing me. And Samuel says, God has turned away from you, Saul, because of your disobedience. And so in the process of this conversation, Samuel's spirit also says to Saul, not only has God taken the kingdom away from you, but you and your sons are going to die in battle. And by this time tomorrow, you'll be with me. That's a quick prophecy of the end of Saul's life. Well, as we read on, Samuel's words come to truth, come to pass, because Saul's sons, we read, are killed in this battle with the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. Now, in the meantime, Saul himself is also wounded by some archers, and he's fatally wounded. He realizes that he's dying, so he turns to his armor bearer as the Philistine army is approaching, and he asks his armor bearer to go ahead and kill him. He doesn't want to be killed by these Philistine men. Well, the armor bearer will have no part of it. So Saul takes his own spear and falls on it. And that then he meets his death. When the Amalekite sees, excuse me, when the armor bearer sees this, he falls on his sword as well. And it appears that both Saul and his armor bearer, along with Saul's sons, are all dead. Now we're told this, and I want to read this little small paragraph from our reading today because we are told very specifically the reason for Saul's death. It's worded this way. Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord and did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Just a short paragraph, but again, Saul is his own worst enemy. He dies, the Lord, we're told, puts him to death simply because of his constant disobedience, trying to go his own way. We'll come back to that in a moment because that's a, a scary reminder for us even today. Now, when Saul's death occurs and the death of Saul's sons occur, news comes back to the Israelite camp. And when Jonathan's son hears this, or when the nurse of Jonathan's son hears this, she picks up Jonathan's son and is trying to escape, and she drops him, and he's crippled as a result. His name is Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth will continue to work into the story a little bit later. Now we read that David learns of Saul's death, and he learns from an Amalekite who has escaped. 
And it's interesting that this Amalekite comes upon Saul and apparently though Saul has impaled himself on his own sword, he is still in the throes of death, but hasn't quite died. And he asks this Amalekite to kill him. And this Amalekite concedes. He agrees to do it. And he feels like he's done some great honor. He takes Saul's crown and his bracelet and takes them to David to say, look what I've done. I've killed Saul just as he asked me to do. And David is saying to him, how dare you? Remember, David was hesitant to ever kill the Lord's anointed. And he says to this Amalekite, how could you possibly kill him? I don't care if he asks you to, you killed the Lord's anointed. And as a result, David has him killed. Now here's a fascinating little caveat. Remember Saul's major act of disobedience when he was told to destroy all of the Amalekites, but he spares the king and he spares the best of the animals? Some time has passed since then, but who is it that actually kills Saul? <laughs> it's an Amalekite. You might call that poetic justice. Well, David is lamenting the death, yes, even of Saul, as well as his good friend, Jonathan. David writes these words, how the mighty have fallen. Saul and Jonathan, he says, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. So David sees the end of Saul's kingship. David sees the end of Jonathan's life. And we'll see as we read in future readings that David never forgets that he made a promise to both of them to take care of and provide for their families. And David, to no surprise, is going to do just that. He is a man after God's heart. As we continue to read, we'll see the transfer of power now the first king of Israel has died. David will be the next king of Israel, and the story is going to turn toward David in his kingship. Let's see if he continues to be a man after God's heart. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we have to pay careful attention to is that Saul was disobedient, and because of his disobedience, he was put to death by the Lord. That's pretty bold, that's pretty harsh sounding. But remember, this story is teaching us about who God is. He is the same God you and I serve. So the question we must ask ourselves is this, how important is it that I be obedient and do exactly as God says? You can see that God takes obedience very seriously. He wants you and me to be holy. He wants you and me to be righteous. He wants you and me to be obedient. And we're learning as we go through this reading together, the high cost of following God, the high cost of being obedient, but the great rewards that are involved as well. Isn't it great to be a lamplighter? His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I hope you have a blessed day.